in this episode of Outback Coroner. People don't understand what lurks beneath these wild rivers. I just remember the surfboat hitting something on the bottom. Then it's just gone down like the Titanic. Time passed on and there's just nothing else we could do. All I want is the truth, that's all I want. I don't want nothing else. Lady walks out the door smiling, doesn't come back. I pose a sentence of two years imprisonment. Take prisoner away. In the prosperous plains of northern New South Wales, water gives life, but it can also take it away. Magistrate Michael Holmes is the local coroner in an area known as New England Northwest. He combines this work with his duties as a magistrate. A lot of the issues that, or matters that come before the court could be one step away from a coroner's inquest. You could have a, a severe a domestic violence incident, which could have resulted in death. There are floods, there are accidents on rivers. So there, there's a lot of factors uh, on a daily basis that uh, the role between a magistrate uh, determining matters um, and that of a coroner um, is a question of uh, sheer luck. The most challenging case Magistrate Holmes has on his slate is an inquest into the deaths of two people who died on a boating trip on the Guaida River in 2011. A surf club on Sydney's northern beaches is mourning the deaths of two of its members. A woman and a four-year-old girl drowned when a boat with seven people on board capsized on the Guaida River near Inverell in the state's north. A family camping trip that went inexplicably wrong. How did it happen? The coroner must find answers. It will be a full inquest. Uh, but what we do, we'll be doing is looking at uh, uh, what evidence to be called and put before the court and also uh, uh, what witnesses should be called also. The group on the river that day had traveled eight hours to the small town of Bingara from Sydney's northern beaches. They were members of the local surf club on their annual camping trip. I've been in the surf club, I guess, since I was a teenager. Um, my father was in it since he was a teenager as well. So a bit of family tradition there as well. It's a, it's a family club. For the Tucker family, Rodney, Vanessa, eight-year-old Hayden and four-year-old Elizabeth, the local surf club was a home away from home. <laughs> oh, it's very relaxed. Yeah, everyone, we all joke around and, and have some fun. We've worn him out. And it's just very social. Yeah, very social club. Oh, quick, get it off your bum. Come on, Hayden. Oh. Let's tackle him. <laughs> <laughs> John Clitheroe's wife, Jane, came from Malaysia. She embraced the Aussie lifestyle to such a degree that she even joined the surf club. Mostly the social side, not actually the, the surf club side. She loved camping, fishing. They went on all these trips every year and um, she loved it. And I had nothing against it. She, wasn't, she was doing what she loved doing, so. The river trip is a long tradition of the North Narrabeen Surf Club. The aim is to introduce city kids to the Australian bush. Members bring surf skis and canoes and camp on the riverbank. The club's aluminium surf boat was taken on every trip. Yeah, it was our turn to go out on the river. Started up as a normal day. We all got ready and went up. We went to launch off. The weather was great and there was, there was not a cloud in the sky. And we were just going with the flow of the river. We weren't paddling at all. Didn't seem to be moving that fast. I just remember the surfboat hitting something on the bottom. Within a matter of seconds, it was just submerged. 
know the boat's gone under. I'm just thinking, you know, come up, come up, come up. And that's all I could think of. And Vanessa's come up. And Elizabeth didn't. Yeah. And Jane didn't come up either. Well, I wasn't there. I, I don't know what's happened. She wasn't a good swimmer, I'm mean, just being truthful. And she, she wasn't a rower. So why did they do all this? I don't know. I'm just, that's the questions I want to be answered. Lady walks out the door smiling, doesn't come back, so I mean. Floating easily down the river one minute, and then swallowed up the next. How could this happen? Was it the fault of the person steering the boat? Was there something wrong with the boat? These are the questions the coroner must answer. My main aim is to identify the cause of death, and that's quite clear, that is drowning. But the manner of death and the circumstances surrounding how the accident occurred, you've got to put yourself in the shoes of those that are grieving. They want answers, and your job is to get the answers for them. On a weekly basis, Magistrate Holmes drives on his circuit. From Armadale to Inverell, to Moree, to Bogabilla, and back to Armadale. I do about 60,000 kilometres in a year. That's the other trouble. You sit all day, you're driving all day, and you're not, you know, you get weight around your stomach. It's no good. Today, Michael Holmes arrives in Inverell a full day of magistrate's hearings. The work that I've done over the years has, has made me uh, suitable for this job. I can remember being a plainclothes police officer involved in uh, post-mortems as a result of murder investigations. And I think, you know, you see some of the worst things that can possibly happen. Michael Holmes has seen it all before. He cares deeply about justice, while his experience on the streets of Sydney can also make him tough. The court has regarded the need for the community to be protected. You are fined the sum of $500 and you're disqualified from driving for two years from today. Thank you very much. You must not assault, molest, harass, threaten or otherwise interfere with the protected person. Furthermore, you must not stalk the protected person, and by way of stalk, that means follow. You're sentenced to a term of imprisonment of 18 months. It will be suspended for 18 months. You can't continue going the way you are going. I sit as a coroner from time to time, and the effects of drug abuse is very clear in that uh, jurisdiction. I have also seen firsthand, as a police officer, uh, the grief people go through and the need to be uh, compassionate. In one case I had, a father that was a policeman attended a fatal accident and his son was there. I could think of nothing worse. Uh, and uh, you're very sad. And you put yourself in the shoes of those individuals. As coroner, Michael Holmes has decided that a full inquest is necessary to look into the deaths of four-year-old Elizabeth Tucker and Jane Clitheroe on the Guida River. We've got the Crown Solicitor's Office coming up with the senior investigator. They will be uh, assisting me uh, in my role as coroner. Jason Ronska, the police officer in charge of investigating the tragedy, begins the task of collecting evidence. No shape or form am I after anyone to attribute any blame any which way. It's, I'm, I'm just after the, the appropriate information. The site of the boating tragedy on the Guida River is just below the Copeton Dam. The dam regularly releases water to irrigate the large cotton farming properties that thrive along the banks of the river. It's likely that this is the location where they've um, actually put the crafts into on the northern side of the river. Yep. Jason meets up with Ian Fraser and Danielle Noble, 
two lawyers from the Crown Solicitor's Office who will have an active role in the upcoming inquest. On the day of the accident, the water level in the Guaida was considerably higher due to water being released from the dam. It was flowing fairly strongly. Compared to today, this is the other side of the coin, basically. That's the mirror opposite of what, what it was. On the river that day was a flotilla of kids on canoes and surf skis. They floated easily downstream. Behind them, the surf boat was launched. On board were six adults, including Jane, and baby Elizabeth was the seventh. The mishap took place only 300 metres below the launch site. So they progressed to come around the corner. Yep. The aim was for them to go to the left-hand side of that limb, to glance off it and continue down the river. They've unfortunately collided with it. It appears yep. to be as close to head-on as possible. Yeah. That's... I oh, know, downstream at the time. Downstream, it's yep. turned around. Turned around that way. It's then collided with the closest limb to us, at which point it's then listed, filled up with water and then sunk. Yep. The rest of the party safely passed the tree. Surely a surf boat that's designed for pounding waves would be safe enough on relatively calm inland waters. It's a mystery the coroner must solve. People don't understand what lurks beneath these wild rivers that uh, form such an important part of Australia. They don't understand the dangerous nature of them. Coroner Holmes lives on a small farm outside of Armidale where he raises cattle. But his special interest is breeding alpacas. This one was born yesterday. I'm happy working in the bush. I was educated at an agricultural school and I like the country life. It's, it's nice. Uh, it's relaxing. I usually leave home at about 4.30 go through Armidale and then up through Gyra and then through to Inveril and then on to Moree. Um, I've always had a love for the country. Uh, one of the uh, things I missed about Australia was the, the outback when I was working in Hong Kong. Michael Holmes spent nine years in Hong Kong, first as a prosecutor and later he became a magistrate there. He returned to Australia after the former British colony was returned to the Chinese. I feel far more at home working in the country than I would in the city. I find working in the Moree uh, part of the circuit uh, quite challenging. Uh, a lot of the problems are, arise because of unemployment, alcohol, mental health issues and general neglect. In Magistrates' Court, Michael Holmes is dealing with a domestic violence case. The events that bring Miss Wetherill before the court are really the culmination of many years of abuse, beginning with her father and then through her relationships with men, she experienced spousal abuse. Uh, Miss Wetherill has had a number of hospital admissions relating to the domestic violence, and some of those occurred while she was pregnant. The night this occurred, Ms Wetherill and Mr Sander had both been drinking alcohol to excess. There was a dispute about uh, fidelity within their relationship and she turned that allegation back to Mr Sander who then punched her and gave her uh, the, the black eye that um, Your Honour has the advantage of seeing the photograph in those submissions I handed up. In the expectation of getting another hiding, Ms Wetherill grabbed a, a knife that was nearby and struck out and, and uh, caused those injuries to Mr Sander. And they are significant injuries, Your Honour. The sad story of Annette Weatherall is not uncommon in Moree. Couldn't handle it no more. So I got on the ground and I just attacked him. After five years living with him, putting up with his domestics, and it just got to me. 
I don't usually do that. I'm not a violent person. This has been a very difficult matter to consider. The court takes into account of all of the matters and the court believes there is only one available option, that is a term of imprisonment. And the court imposes a term of 18 months imprisonment. However, the court believes the matter should be dealt with by way of a section 12 suspended sentence for 18 months. If you breach it, you'll be sent straight to jail. Do you understand that? But I'm certain you've been able to keep out of trouble, uh, get that help, get that support. I believe that at the end of the day, you won't be back before a court again. That's one of the good things about being a magistrate. You understand what the community requires and the problems in the community. I just like to think people think I care. Now, it's a small town. If you see us in the street, if I'm, you see me walking around, I don't think I'm rude, but I can't talk to you, so thank you. It's not like the old days where people would uh, socialise and that you can't afford to be seen preferring the company of police. You can't be seen to be preferring the company of, of, of defence lawyers. It is a bit lonely. You've got to just keep to yourself, and I think that's the best way. I think that's part of my nature. I think I can do it. Some other people would find it hard, but I tend to be a fairly solitary person. Detective Jason Ronska and Ian Fraser from the Crown Solicitor's Office continue their investigation into the deaths of Jane Clitheroe and Elizabeth Tucker who died in a boating tragedy on the Guida River. Coming, Josh. So there's two maps you're on. Where did the incident take place? Where number, the, where number two is? Yellow two. dot. And where's the dam? Up here. Yeah, number five. Seeing you from Sydney, you can see the, the expanse and the difficulties in, in these areas. They're fairly isolated, aren't they, when you look at it? Absolutely. When four-year-old Elizabeth died, it was any parent's worst nightmare. You know, you want to give your kids an opportunity of a lifetime and do fun things with them. And Rodney and Hayden had been on two previous river trips. You know, this was our first one as a family. Elizabeth was special for all who knew her. Very bright, very intelligent, made friends very easily. You know, she would walk into a room of children she didn't know. And before he knew what was going on, they were all her friends. Every day she was in our lives was a blessing. And um, just the most wonderful four and a, almost four and a half years of our lives. The inquest will be a challenge for Rodney and Vanessa. I think for us, it's going to bring it all back up and maybe open old wounds for Jane's family. It's more of a closure thing for them, I guess. If we were there, we know what happened. They weren't. They don't know what happened. Jane Clitheroe's family in Malaysia keep asking what happened. And John finds it difficult to give them answers. All I want is the truth. That's all I want. I don't want nothing else. And once that's, we get that, I think we can all rest with minds. I think what it is, we've got things in our heads that were driving us crazy. And we, well, who do you ask? You can't, you can't say to Jane, what happened? Can I? I can't. Michael Holmes' inquest into the two deaths on the Guida River is approaching. Like all inquests, uh, the grief touches a community as a whole, uh, in particular the family. But I believe this will help to some extent to look forward to the future and to ensure that such sad and tragic things don't happen again. 11 months after the accident, Michael Holmes begins a three-day inquest in Moree. If I can start uh, at the outset, uh, 
As with all inquests, these are matters that touch many people within a community. A coronial inquest is essentially an inquiry. It is not a criminal or civil trial in which two opposing parties engage in legal combat. And I wish to emphasise that. The surf boat in question, or the rowboat, is made of aluminium. It's designed to be crewed by four rowers and steered by a person uh, called a sweep, whose role it was to steer it with a fifth large oar out the back of the boat. On the day in question, there was also a spotter. The rowers faced backwards and were therefore unable to see where they were going, meaning they were reliant on the sweep and the spotter. The sweep, Michael McDermott, had used the surf boat safely on inland rivers many times before. We've known each other since I joined the club as a teenager. Um, you know, his wife, Trish, and I, we did our bronze medallions together. Yeah, so I guess, you know, 25 odd years we've known each other. Do you have a recollection of that site from previous trips? I do. I navigated the same on every occasion. Get the oars parallel to the side of the boat, so trail where the rowers lay back, let the oar go over the head to effectively narrow the boat. I positioned the bow of the boat so that the starboard side glances off the tree. Immediately that happens, I pull the back of the boat around with the sweep oar, effectively using the branch of the tree as a lever. And I'm then able to pull the back of the boat around into what is the main current. It's hard to explain, but um, you know, we've, we've laughed with Michael, we've and Trish, we've cried with them, we've, you know, gotten drunk with them. They're friends of ours and it was just a tragic accident and um, mm. there's certainly, I don't know if I can speak for Rodney, but there's certainly no, you know, resentment or fault or blame or anything like that. Elizabeth's father, Rodney, is called to give evidence. Now, I understand this will be very, very difficult for you. So there's a glass of water there. I want you to take it easy. But if you need to have a break, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do okay. that. Thank you. OK. There was a briefing, is that right? Safety yes. briefing? Could you tell me what that involved generally? And Michael gave his safety briefing on what certain commands meant, the, you know, the lay back or then the trail your oars and, and things like that. This trip away was an annual event for North Narrabeen Surf Club members. They'd been to the Guaida River many times and used the aluminium surf boat to travel downstream. The boat trip had been completed safely only the day before. Approaching what it turned out to be the site of this accident, can you tell us what happened? Uh, we didn't actually row for that long. We just got a bit of um, speed up and then we sort of trailed the oars and the oars and just drifted down. And was that something you did on, as a result of a direction from yes. Mr McDermott? That's correct, yes. And to trail the oars, if you could just tell us about just that. Just put the oars to, at the side of the boat, just pull them up and have them at the side. All right. Yeah, sort of half sitting in and the handles sort of hanging out the side of the boat. I pulled my camera out and took some photos while we were just flowing down with the current. Yes. So I said to Elizabeth, turn around and take your photo, and obviously she said no. And just after I put my camera away, then sort of everything started to happen. What was the first thing that made you aware that something was wrong? Michael said, oh, get your oars in the water and, and row. So there was a direction to row. Yeah. And before we could do that, we hit something and swung around. All right. Before we could do that, I saw the tree. I'm not sure if it was an impact or, or what. This is where I'm a bit blurry. Oh. Yeah. Um, and what I remember is sitting in the boat, um, looking at Elizabeth and thinking to grab her. And before I could, the boat tipped a bit and very quickly water came in and then we were over. I ended up hanging up on the tree. I could feel the boat banging against my legs as it was sinking. Everyone's saying, oh, where's, where's so-and-so? Um, there's Vanessa, there's Rodney, there's Michael, there's you know, Sparrow, where's, where's Jane, where's Elizabeth? And I said, 
they're, they're still in the boat, the boat's sunk. I got to the first tree, and that's where I got into trouble myself. I then got caught in the current and got pushed to the, to the right side and got dragged under into the roots. And it was at that point that I reached up and grabbed some, uh, some roots above me and pushed, pulled myself back up and managed to pull myself up onto that part of the tree. Because yeah, if I didn't do that, I'd, I would have gone under myself. I didn't know that, I didn't see that. So that was actually quite distressing for me because I guess just knowing potentially that this whole thing could have been a lot worse. So I climbed out onto the tree with Michael. We tried sticking our legs in the water, trying to feel for the boat with our legs and we couldn't feel it. And I'm saying, it's there, it's there, it's there. It's not downstream, it's, it's there. Time passed on and there's nothing else we could do. Named after the river that flows beside it, the Guida Highway stretches over 500 kilometres through Michael Holmes' jurisdiction. In a break in proceedings in Moree, the coroner has come to Inverell to finalise a second inquest. As you can see, there's a number of roads or streets entering in at different angles. The death of a 70-year-old pedestrian has raised significant public safety issues. This next intersection is where the uh, collision occurred. The, the person was attempting to cross the road. The tragedy is not just the death of the individual, it's the impact on the, the individual's family and also the impact on the individual that was the uh, driver of the motor vehicle. There's been a traffic problem for the you know, 12 years that I've been here and finally, unfortunately, someone's had to die um, for it to be addressed. I live on up in that south side of Inverell and my daughter now walks to school across that road. It's very difficult to time your passage across that road without a traffic island or something to um, assist you. All she was trying to do was just come across the road here but see these cars turning right, the other cars come up on the other side, past that car and collected her. Because of her uh, age, the impact um, caused her death. The most important thing in relation to this uh, inquest is uh, the potential for recommendations. Thank you. I call uh, Senior Constable uh, Mark McLaughlin, the investigating officer. About 5.27 p.m., Detective Senior Constable Wilcox and I arrive at the intersection of the Guider Highway and Froud Street in Varel, where I noticed an amount of red-brown coloured substance near the centre line on the roadway, which appeared to be blood. To assist the coroner, police filmed a recreation of the accident. The deceased pedestrian is 76 years of age. We have a mannequin similar coloured clothing near the southern curb in line with where the deceased came to rest on the roadway. The driver of the motor vehicle would collide with the deceased. It was 84 years old, female. The accident happened late in the afternoon. The Guida Highway has two westbound lanes. In lane two, cars were waiting to turn right. I had Senior Constable Roberts drive the test vehicle along Guida Highway in lane two until he approached two stationary motor vehicles, then merged into lane one on the westbound lanes and continued travelling west until after the point of impact. Whilst conducting the reenactment of the fatal motor vehicle accident, it was quite clear that the position of the sun was causing problems with all persons involved in the exercise. The sun would have clearly affected the 84-year-old driver's view of the pedestrian. The mannequin's red shirt was barely visible. There are a number of persons, including young school students, required to cross the Guada Highway around the location of the accident. I would recommend that a safer means should be available to pedestrian traffic wishing to cross the Guada Highway. My findings are as follows. The direct cause of, of death 
being multiple injuries being sustained as a result uh, of a motor vehicle collision. I recommend that the work to change the traffic flow arrangements be carried out as a matter of some urgency. I express my uh, sympathies to the family and friends of the deceased and my appreciation to the police for their investigative work. Thank you. That's a, a great thing of the cranial system is that someone dies and we get recommendations in preventing that in the future. And so as a community, we all learn. And yes, that's uh, something the family might take some solace with in relation to that a death has been worthwhile. It's um, now made this change that nothing like this will ever happen again. Day two of Coroner Holmes' inquest into the boating accident on the Guaida River gets underway. And you were given the role of spotter? Yes, and, and reserve rower. And reserve rower. That's right. Mark Hazel, also known as Sparrow, was a good friend of Jane's and was also on the boat. The last thing I said was stuck. I'd gone under the bow, I'd gone under that branch, and all of a sudden there was an almighty summer, and I felt it through my feet, then all of a sudden, the uh, back end of the boat ran back towards there. Yes. And as it's gone back, it's tilted on its side and it's just gone down like, like the Titanic, if I can use that phrase, oh. stern down into the water. Right behind Jane was little Elizabeth. And the last example, I saw Jane, I got the back of her blue top over the side, downstream. I thought, I just thought, oh, they're out, oh, she's out. The kids floating downstream beside the boat soon realised what had happened and ran to a nearby farm to raise the alarm. Police and SES were on site promptly. When you arrived at the scene, uh, what trace of the boat could you see? The tail end of an oar sticking up to where we believed the boat was. I think that's the oar to which you were referring, that is Sergeant. Uh, what was your assessment of, of this particular site? That it was incredibly dangerous, I guess, was my first impression. Based on my experience, and I live on that river, and I also uh, navigated quite a lot, so it was dangerous. There's no two ways about that. To try and locate the boat, the SES probed the water with a two and a half metre pole. Were you able to touch the bottom? No. Uh, and were you able to identify any object other than Nothing. the, the no. tree that you were The force were of the water was significant. Uh, trying to keep the pole out at all from the trees was very difficult, and I could not reach the bottom with the pole. The irrigation water was still flooding out of Copeton Dam, not far upstream. And presumably you didn't enter the faster moving water further in? No, no. And I... the reason for that? I didn't want to become another casualty. OK, so you were concerned. It was a very risky spot. Any chance of rescue was now out of the question. Finding Elizabeth and Jane was now a recovery operation. The SES deployed their own boat attached to a safety line, which enabled them to find the missing surf boat. It sort of made us realise, well, you know, there really was nothing we could do and not to sort of be down on ourselves because we, we didn't save. Elizabeth or Jane or, or managed to find the boat and, and bring it up. If we, even if we did find the boat, there was probably nothing we could have done to, to bring it up. Are you able to point out on that the location of the boat? We've virtually got two arms there, haven't we, right out in the stream. So the boat was between the two arms, pretty much. Peter Turnbull is a local and knows the river well. The river is, uh, I guess it's the reason I'm still in Bingra. He has his own theory as to what happened to the surf boat. Day of the accident, the water level would have been up here somewhere. I'd have been pretty much underwater. The boat, I believe, swung into here, stern first. As Soon as it started to take water, it would have swung underneath and wound up pinned against this log over here, 
which we were totally unable to see on the day. It would have been right underwater. That's my opinion. There's, uh, there's no way we can tell, of course. Peter's theory is put before the coroner. In the foreground on the left now is a section of tree that has not been previously visible. And seeing that, it actually made some sense about what did actually happen and, and how it happened and why the boat got stuck where it did. Yes, thank you. Before the boat was recovered, Copeton Dam was asked to shut off the water release and the river level receded. Eight hours after the accident, the boat was finally retrieved at around 6 p.m. And the police came later in the evening and said the boat's come up, they've been recovered, now we need you to come out and, and identify them. So we went out for Elizabeth and the person that Jane had come up with, Mark, he came out as well to identify her. So they were just on the, on the riverbank when we got there. And she just looked like Snow White, asleep like Snow White. There was no... I couldn't see any marks on her body, like a, a head or a hand or a leg, couldn't... And I just gave a little kiss on the cheek for John. That sort of thing, crying. I re, re zipped the bag. He said, oh, no, it's OK, mate. He said, that is... Is that Jane Clisser? I said, yes. Thank you, mate. Now, you in inspected... Both, both bodies? That's correct. And just dealing with Elizabeth Tucker, she was wearing a, a life jacket, is that right? That's correct. And she was still wearing that? It was still attached and her nose, forehead, had protruded down within the life jacket itself um, to the top joint of the life jacket. Her arms were protruding as if um, she was dropping through the life jacket through the bottom of it. At times, Coroner Holmes would prefer that people left the room, but it's their decision. I feel dreadfully sorry for her. You know, you, you wish you could say, look, you can go out for this, you can go out for that, and uh, they can if they wish, but the trouble is when the law takes over, sometimes it can be a little bit analytical and they forget about the people that are involved, and that's something that, that's close to my heart not to allow that to happen. After analysing the events of the day, the coroner now turns his attention to the suitability of a boat like this on inland waters. As part of his investigation, Sergeant Ronska asked an experienced boat crew to demonstrate the manoeuvre needed to pass the tree. Cobden Dam was asked to release water so there would be similar conditions to the day of the accident. The expert's small boat completed the manoeuvre with ease. So was the surf boat too big for the river? Was this an accident just waiting to happen? Back in Armidale, the chores on the farm are a welcome break from the daily demands of court. Most all packers know they're cute. How are you going? They've got character and they've got their own little personalities. This, this one's full of personality, the one in the front. It's just got an attitude problem. Michael Holmes' magistrate duties continue. Police prosecutor Darren Murray is assisting him on one case that is reaching its conclusion. There's a young man on court here today. He's just got a lot of anger issues and uh, along the way, probation, parole service, juvenile justice, his parents, me, have tried to assist him with rehabilitation, but uh, he just uh, cracks when he gets angry. He's here for sentence today. Uh, it's a very strong case against him and uh, hopefully the public will be safe for a couple of years after today. There are two separate charges. Prosecutor, assault occasion, actual bodily harm. The second one is reckless, grievous bodily harm. He has entered pleas of not guilty to those uh, charges. We say there's clear evidence that he can be found guilty of both charges by not only the three witnesses hearing the assault taking place, but you have the evidence of the person inside the house 
that hears the moaning when she looks out and sees the victim carrying on the lounge. He suffered bruising, he suffered a broken jaw, he suffered bleeding, he suffered um, a brain injury in relation to his own evidence that his memory is now gone in relation to the incident. Your Honour, at the, on the same night he was arrested for uh, assaulting his mother-in-law. What, he assaulted his mother-in-law? It was a, a push to the ground. Mm. Um, right. What can you tell the court about your client? Not at this stage, Your Honour. Well, what do you mean, not at this stage? This is a sentencing process. You're either going to put something or you're not. You've got nothing to put. No, nothing further, Your Honour. Thank you. I've got a way of a letter, Your Honour, but I'd like to read it out. Mm. Your Honour, I've only just started to realise how important I am to my children. I never had a father. I never got shown what to do or how to, how to act. You know, I've, I've found my reason to change my life. I, I believe that this is the last time I'll come back to jail. What are you proposing to do in the future? I know I have a problem with anger. I know I have a problem with alcohol. First and utmost intentions to get that sorted. Um, I plan to go to TAFE and, and get my high school equivalency. Listen very carefully to what I'm about to say, Mr Case. The court has an obligation to ensure that you're adequately punished for the offence and again, to get a message out into the community, this, this sort of violent behaviour cannot be condoned. The facts uh, were appalling. There is very little options that the court can consider other than imposing a period of imprisonment. I propose to impose a sentence of a period of two years imprisonment. Each matter is to be concurrent. Thank you. Take prisoner away. Michael Holmes' inquest into the deaths of Jane Clitheroe and Elizabeth Tucker continues. Of course, when tragedy strikes, the emotions are complex. Why did the accident happen? Did someone fail to take proper care? We're not looking for blame. We're looking for ways of preventing these things from happening again. The evidence which you shall give to this inquest on behalf of our sovereign lady, the Queen, shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. The man carrying a heavy load in this case is the man who was in charge, the sweep who was steering the boat, Michael McDermott. Why was a surf boat used? on these river trips. We took surf club equipment. You gave the people who were going on the boat both days a briefing. Yes. And part of that briefing involved manoeuvres. Yes. Were those manoeuvres practised? They were. And during those briefings, was there any direction to people as to what to do if someone went into the water? No, I can't recall saying anything like that. Is that something that you've given any thought to? It is something I've given thought to, but it's given my years of experience on the river, it was something that was unlikely to happen. The first time Michael took a surf boat down this river was eight years ago. And the most recent time was the day before the accident. Did you notice any difference in the water level? It didn't seem any different to the day before. In any way? In any way. And was it your belief up until just after the impact that this was just like every other time? A few metres from impact was when I probably realised that it wasn't going to hit the tree in the same spot and that it was slightly off, six, eight inches, that sort of thing. Did you try to perform the manoeuvre? I did. Um, I remember looking up at Rodney and saying, keep the boat level, and within a split second of saying that, the port gunnel dipped, and within a second of that, the whole thing rolled. You were thrown from the boat? I still don't know what happened. I don't know if I went under with the boat, whether I went over the boat, under the tree, over the tree. All I remember is coming up probably 10 metres downstream in knee depth water. It's hard to watch your friends up there giving evidence on the loss of, you know, losses of lives of people that um, they're really close to. I think it's fair to say you never considered that perhaps the surf boat wasn't appropriate for use on the river. No, I didn't consider it inappropriate because of the amount of times I'd used it successfully. It's understandable that an aluminium boat designed for heavy surf might be considered safe enough for calm inland waterways. 
but the underside of the boat reflects a violent collision. Hey, how it's long. So, so long. So that's where the sweep all would go in this rusty old bracket there. Yes. What else do you have in here? These are the other remaining oars. Yeah, so we've recovered three. That being the sweep. Yeah. I mean, that's an exceptionally long, cumbersome thing. I, I think the boat was far too big for the river in the conditions. I have to say, I'm not familiar with surf lifesaving boats. I've only ever watched them race on the TV in the carnivals. But when you look at them and you see the length of the oars, you, you see how much length of boat you have to manoeuvre around tight places. And when you're going down swift water in a boat, manoeuvrability is pretty much everything. I would think that the risks associated with putting a boat of that type with those large oars down that particular river in those conditions were quite excessive. What sort of oar is, is appropriate from your experience? A manageable one, a short manageable one. One of the oars was recovered from the accident site. Have you any observations about that oar? You would not be able to respond quickly enough to the demands of the river with an oar that size in my view. Coroner Holmes retires briefly to consider his findings. Firstly, it is my view that the response of the various emergency services to the situation cannot be faulted. Whilst I cannot uh, reach a conclusion as to the precise mechanism as to how the boat came to be trapped at the location where it was found by the SES volunteers, I concluded that it had filled completely with water and that both Elizabeth Tucker and Jane Cliffero had been trapped beneath it. In my opinion, the primary cause of the accident itself was the unsuitability of the boat for this stretch of river. Surf rowboats are designed primarily for use in the surf. The fact that the boat had previously been used without serious incident in inland rivers does not sway me from this view. They'd been down many rivers many times. They'd been down that river many times before in previous years. So I guess they're just saying that to say, well, it was unsuitable well. Yeah, even though it had been down there numerous times before. Mm. <clears throat> It'll now just prevent other people from putting a craft like that into those waters. The coroner also recommended that surf boat crews should wear life-saving vests. Again, I would like to express my uh, sympathy to the families. Um, and this has been a very tragic matter. Uh, and all I can say is my uh, heartfelt uh, feelings are with you. Thank you, sir. Did you get an award? Before I went, the emotion was very angry. Afterwards, I was very relieved and very happy, actually. It opened my mind to a lot of things. I don't think you could blame really anybody. I think it's just a, one of them things that happened. Jane Clitheroe was cremated in Australia and her ashes have been interred in a Buddhist temple in Malaysia. They couldn't have done anything. I mean, it wouldn't have mattered to you where they said Ian Thorpe couldn't have swam out of it. So to me, that's, she died peacefully, so. Lessons are learnt. And despite this tragedy, friendships will survive and may even flourish. Of course, this afternoon is a time once again for us to remember Elizabeth. Uh, we continue to grieve, but not without hope. Our relationship before the trip was good. We were strong. We were in a good place. You know, life was perfect. <laughs> now it's just a little less perfect, but we're doing the best we can. a three-hour drive in front of me. I'll be avoiding kangaroos. It's very important that uh, even in family history, you know, 100 years' time, that people might say, what happened here? And at least there's a record that people know what's happened. Even though we've had tragedy, 
there's an outcome that that won't happen again. That's one of the things that I really like about the coroner's jurisdiction. You can get positive outcomes. I think it's a very important role. 